So, hello. <laughs> so, welcome. Um, can you guys hear my voice? Is sound coming through? So I'll be waiting a little bit for uh, people commenting. If the sound is coming through, let me know. And if the picture is alright too, of course. Loud and clear. Thank you, Kashmund. So, the chat is working on my side. So let's see who's there. Okay. A ah. few people are online. So, hi to everyone. I will just going to uh, check if the chat is working in the other way. So, just wrote a message. Hi, can you see this message? So let me know if you can read it. Yes, all right. So, um, I would like to uh, thank you for coming and for watching. And if you want to have a better sound, it would be a good idea maybe to use some headphones that you know, because we will be listening to some samples. And it's maybe better than if you're watching on a mobile phone or a laptop. And yeah, we will also have some parts where there will be some questions and answers. So at the middle of the, the hour and at the end, so you guys can ask some questions about the topics we will talk about or about the project multitracks. Um, so what is multitracks? Let's start with that. So multitracks is a project that we started last year and it has three parts. So the first part we did a sample, sampler. So we asked people to send songs uh, to a theme that we chose and the theme was meaning of music and we released every uh, single one of them. And then we had three producers that listened through the sampler and picked three songs they liked. And we went to the studio to produce those songs. So two days of studio per song. And that's the multi-track sessions. And during those sessions, we also did a documentation, a video documentation, and did three little films uh, about the process and the artist in the studio. So this is the multitracks project. This is the web page uh, about the sessions. So what session are we going to use today? Today we are going to look at the Dancing Alone sessions. We also have Soon and Herzke Auf from uh, Lucas Mack and Odelia. But we, today we are going to use the Dancing Alone song from Lea Haufler. Um, you can go on the web page and click on here and you can also find everything about this, so the documentation. You can also listen to the produced song, got the lyrics, the credits, the song in the original version uh, that was sent to the sampler, some pictures. And you can also download the mp3 or the multitracks of the recordings. Here is a list of what those multitracks are, what instruments, what microphones we, we picked. And to get them, you can click on the Hochspur plus mix, mix stems, and you will land on this web page. And you can get those tracks for five euros. And this way, you can also help the project. Um, even if you don't want to use the tracks and you just want to help the multi-tracks project and uh, you can get those tracks, that will be a big help for 5 euros. Or you can also for 10 euros get all three tracks. So from Lea, from Odelia and from Lucas. Uh, for today, I'm also going to send you a link now on the comments where you can get the drums from the song Dancing Alone, Lea Häufler for free and this link will be working for 24 hours so tomorrow um, it will not work anymore i will post a uh, link on the the group that i created in the facebook event and you can also find that link 
later on. Uh, if you decide to download it right now, use this link that I'm going to share now in the chat room. So when you download it, you will get a rare file, a compacted file. And it looks like this. And to open this file, you need WinRare. To get WinRare, you just have to go WinRare. And it's a free software. Download it, install, and you can get the files out of that uh, compacted single file. And you will get these files. And these are the drums that we recorded. All right. Um, mixing with Rob. This format, I saw it last year. Um, during the first lockdown, I did some uh, mixing sessions online. They were very long. They went for six hours each. Um, I will repost them on the YouTube channel so you guys can have a look at that too um, in your time. And this time I'm decided to uh, make them shorter, just make like one hour. And so this is where this format comes from. And back then we, or the process that I use and what I talked about were the six elements of a mix. So to get this document that I'm showing you right now, you can have a look at the description of uh, this video and you can download it, download it or also go to the Multitracks webpage and under Mixing with Rob, you can download the PDF. So back then we looked at the six elements of a mix. So balance, frequency range, panorama, dimension, dynamics and interest. And we did that looking at like the drum. So we did the balance of the drums. We did the frequency range of the drums, the panorama, dimensions, dynamic interest of the drums. And then we went back to balance with the bass and went through again the frequency range, the panorama, dimension, dynamic interest. And then when we turned on the guitars, we went back to balance and we did like a, like a circle. That was how we made the process of the mix. And this time I want to do it different since we are doing only one hour uh, session. So we will look at balance for drums. And later on another live stream, we will look at frequency range on another stream at panorama, dimension, dynamics and so on. So it will be a different process. And it's also a decision as a mixer that you can take uh, how you want to go through your tracks and your mix and both ways are fine and you can try out those different type of processes and you will get different type of results and it's something I always uh, before I mix a song um, decide what uh, how I'm going to do it uh, depending on the song and the tracks um, yeah and so I get different results doing it in different ways. So this time, since we are doing it bit by bit, I want to go through this process with you. And for this, I created a Facebook group called the Shared Platform. And here we will be able to share stuff that we mix at home. So if you guys download the, the drum tracks, you can mix them share them in the group and we can give give each other feedback and go through the process together um yeah so let's start with the content adua this is the first thing i'm going to talk about today adua is a daw it's a digital audio workstation this digital audio workstation is an open source software meaning that it doesn't uh, cost a lot of money. It's, uh, it's minimum one euro. So to get that software, you go on download and go to ready to run program. And you can download it for Linux, Windows and Mac OS. And so you can use the same program that I'll be using today at home. 
if you never use a program, so before you spend 300 euros, 600 euros on a professional program, you can try out Adua. It's a very professional program. I actually deleted all the other software I was using and I switched completely to Adua. Um, till now, I'm very happy with it and I'm still in the learning process and this I will carry on doing uh, through these uh, live streams episodes that I'll be doing. So Adua is also a very good manual. So if you want to check out the software before you download it, um, it's very well conceived, uh, very helpful. Okay, so Adua. Let's open the, the software. This is the program that I'm going to show you today. So when you will install it, it will first look like this and it is possible to change the interface. So the way it looks and where you find things. Um, I don't really like this type of uh, view because I'm used to something else. I've been using Pro Tools since the last 10 years nearly. So I'm going to show you a little bit how you can change this interface to fit your needs. So here on the view option, you've got up here things you can turn on and off for the editor view or for the mixing view. So what I really enjoy is having this track here so that I can see in my editing mode everything what's happening in the track whilst I'm doing it. Another thing I like to have is the editor list. So here you will have a list of all the WAV files you will have in your project. So you can sort them. It's your library. This is the mixing view. So to change them from the mixing view to the editor view, there's this button on the top right. This is how it's, uh, the program will be um, when you install it. What I don't like is that this thing here is really big. So you can also move this. You can make it a little bit smaller. This part here is called the... What is it called? Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Summary. Show summary. Yeah. So you can turn that on and off. So basically here you will see all the tracks. I don't really need that, so I will just make it a bit smaller. So I've got a small bar here to swipe left and right. So it looks a little bit different. Let's have a look at the interface. So up here you've got your controls, play, stop, record, very basic, punch and record. This we will see in uh, later episodes. So follow range and auto return. This is very interesting. So what does follow range mean? So to show you that I have to zoom in. So if follow range is off and I play, I press play, the playhead, when it gets out of the window, it doesn't follow it. Oh, it shouldn't. Hmm. So if it's turned on, it follows the playhead. And this is very helpful because otherwise you lose where uh, the track of where you are in the song. Another very helpful tool is the auto return. So whilst you're editing, sometimes it's helpful to have this on, sometimes it's not. So it's good that you can turn on and off right here. And what does this mean? So if I press play and stop, the playhead stops where I stopped. If I do auto return, when I stop, when I stop, it will jump back to where it started. In certain situations, this can be very helpful. In other situations, this can be also very helpful, especially in editing. So up here, you've got kind of a control bar to move around the timeline. And you can also see the ranges up here. So you can move your playhead to different places in the timeline. Up here, you've got a master uh, meter. So you can see if uh, things are peaking. 
down here it uh, is for the zoom option so if you want to zoom in and playhead is selected it will zoom in where the playhead is if you choose mouse it will zoom in where the mouse is so I find it more helpful if the playhead is on uh, I will turn my camera off right now so that you guys can see more of the window because I'm just recognizing that the camera is uh, hiding some things. So on this button you can zoom in and out. With this button you can automatically make the, the view to where the end and the start of the song is. With this button you can increase, expand the track that you have or decrease them. Here you can select how many tracks you want to see at once. Also very helpful. Okay, in this section here is very helpful to sometimes to have the snap on. What does this mean? It will snap to, let me zoom in, to the grid. So if I try to place the playhead here, it will jump to the grid point, which is closer to it. Without this on, it will jump to where you click. So this can also be very helpful sometimes to have on, sometimes to have off, depending on the situation. Here are the different tools that you have. So this is the grab mode, so you can move your wave files left and right in the timeline the range mode so you can expand them the cut mode so you can cut them audition mode so you can have a listen to them uh, by themselves very helpful is the smart button so what is the smart button it's the um the grab and the the range mode in one so depending where your mouse is you see, the mouse is now in grab mode. Right now it's in range mode and you press in smart. If you're in the middle of the track, it will be in range mode. If you go under it, it will switch to grab mode. All right, so I think this is the interface of the editor window and I will switch now to the mixer editor. Ah, there's a question. Uh, the follow range, yeah. I also had this problem with the follow range. It also stopped working and I reset the, the software, de installed it, installed it again and the problem was gone. I think it's probably a bug. So open source softwares, um, you can uh, on the web page from Arduo in a certain space uh, have, uh, it's not a complaint, how do you call that? Let me open the web page and we have a look at that. <clears throat> so, support. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Requirements, community. All right. Bug tracker feature request. So, you can in, uh, fill out this form or uh, use this forum to uh, tell them that the follow range is not working and they will try to fix that problem uh, in the future. This is all, uh, very, always very good in open source softwares. So, Mixer. So this area over here is also very helpful. So you can decide if you want to see or hide some tracks. So I decided to hide some tracks for now because these are the tracks I'm using to route the signal to the stream. In this area down here, um, you can hide and show groups that you will make with the tracks. This is also another feature we will see in the future. And up here, favorite plugins. We also talk about plugins in other episodes. On the right side, you've got your master output. All right. So I think that's it. This is the interface. Other configurations. So if you want to change some preferences, go to edit, 
and preferences and you've got here a list of things you can change in the software so in the general option I decided to in the CPU utilization to decide to keep one processor um, free for the operating system all but one this is also the setting that uh, is standard when you install Ardor and down here you can decide how much megabytes Ardor is able to use from your hard disk so depending on your PC it might um, be able to go to the maximum and not have any problems maybe your PC has uh, not so much power and you need to pull this down so I think at the beginning it was something around here uh, so it will be better for the computer if it could to have it in the maximum and you will not have uh, um, less uh, problems with your hard disk reading and writing on it uh, but if you set it too high and your computer doesn't have enough power it will uh, produce some glitches and pops so you have to change the setting according to your computer so what uh, translation this is a very helpful so you can translate your Arduino to the language of your operating system if you want to so if you have a German uh, Windows and you press on here suddenly Arduino is in German um, all right, what are other preferences that are helpful at the beginning? The signal flow. Yeah, so signal flow. Up here, record monitoring handled by Aldua or audio hardware. So if you're using a conventional interface, it's better for you to let Ardor handle that. If you're using a lot of uh, output, uh, outboard gear, hardware, you should maybe change the option uh, very interesting option is down here this strict IO so I decided to turn it off why what is strict IO so if you create a mono track it will automatically create a one input and one output if you create a stereo track it will do two inputs and two outputs for the stereo uh, for some situations I don't like that and to be able to change it you have to tick this off so not use strict I.O. use flexible I.O. and then connect back uh, track and bus outputs manually so if you put it uh, when you install the program it's set to automatically to master bus so it goes automatically to the master I prefer to have it manual so I can do my own routings but if you're starting with uh, this type of software and uh, mixing, maybe it's better to first leave it to master bus. In my case, I rather have it to manual. Up here, you can also decide if Arduino will connect the tracks automatically to the physical inputs, so to the inputs of your uh, interface, or if you do them manually. I find it uh, easier if it's in automatical uh, automatically than having to do that each time okay so audio <clears throat> mm -hmm, mm -mm. up here you can decide um, or you can tell hardware how many tracks you're uh, going to use and it will automatically change the settings down here to a setting that will probably be uh, working better for the computer so if you're only using uh, 16 to 64 tracks you can change to that playback second of buffering so it will listen 10 seconds ahead keep it in its memory and then playback um, if you're using more tracks it will have to adjust some delays with um, plugins and stuff like that compensations so it's better for it to have a bit more of uh, listening ahead if you have more tracks it will uh, have to work a bit more in the delay compensation but this is also a theme that we will talk about in other episodes more in detail 
So, regions. Enable automatic analysis of audio. This is also something that was turned off and I decided to turn it on because Ardua also has the tool called in Pro Tools which is called Tap to Transient. In Ardua it's just called, uh, can't remember what it's called but it's in the manual. Um, I also will show you this in editing mode, but if you're a Pro Tools user and you're wondering why is uh, where is this tap to transient, which is very helpful, you have to press Control and then uh, left or right on your keyboard, and it will jump to the transient. But to turn for it to work, it needs to analyze the audio in beforehand, so this has to be turned on. So there's also options to change meterings, but this is a topic we're going to talk today later. VST plugins, we will talk also in a other episode. And appearance, you can change colors and stuff like that. So basically this is the preferences of Ardua. Configuration. So the next thing we will do, we will import some tracks. To do so, you have to go to Sessions on the top left, click Import, and you have to browse to the, the place where you've got your audio tracks. In my case, it's in my work drive. Mixing with Rob, Source. And here are the tracks in the link that I sent to you. And select it. Very important is to have this turned on, copy files to session, so that it will copy the files into the session. If you don't do that <clears throat> and you decide to delete a file in your Outdoor project, it will delete it completely from your uh, hard disk and you will lose it. So it's very important to have copy file to session clicked on. So click import and it will convert to the desired sample rate and bit rate and add some tracks. Oh, another place you can find a link for the tracks is in this, this PDF that I showed you before. Down here, you've got some links. So all the links, all the web pages that I showed you are in this PDF. So free drum tracks available until the 15th of January. So tomorrow at 19 p.m. Uh, 7 p.m. And here is the link. So the information also in this PDF are helpful in further episodes that we will be doing today. The phase is the, probably the most important that we will be talking about, maybe at the end of the session. And I also have a German translation. So up, the first two, the first pages are, are in English, and then there's a German translation of all of this. <clears throat> so here are the tracks. Oh yeah, let's talk about... Um, the bit rate and also the sample rate. So if you go to sessions and properties, this window will open. And if you go to media, you can set here what the sample format will be for the project. So 24 bit, 16 bit or 32 bit floating. So when you create a new project, on Ardua, it will be by default on 32-bit floating. If you want to have it uh, in a different bit, so you have to come in here with your new project, change it before you import audio. Um, Ardua also has a very helpful feature. You can save templates. So when you create a new project, it will show you a list of templates that you saved. So maybe the first thing you can do is create three different projects with the three different sample rates and name, name them accordingly so that you have them in a list when you open uh, Ardua and want to create a session. 
in the preferences was it there no what was that Ah, yeah. The, the sample rate, you decide which sample rate before you create the session. When you press on new, you decide if it's um, 48 or 44.1 and so on. You cannot change that after you create the project. So we imported some tracks. They are all mono tracks, meaning it's one input, one output. To create tracks without files or to create new tracks and new buses, you can go either to track, add track bus or VCA, or you can press on this plus button here. And this window will open. You've got here a list of templates. You can create also your own templates, which is also very helpful. Um, audio tracks, so you can decide if it's mono or stereo. You can insert the name. You can also decide how many of these tracks you want to create. And down here, pin mode. So by default, it's strict to uh, strict I/O. I decide to have it as flexible I/O. So I, I can decide later on if I want to have two inputs. So I can uh, transform a mono track into a stereo or a stereo into a mono. <coughs> But I will show you why that is maybe needed uh, a bit later on. Here you can create MIDI tracks, audio buses, MIDI buses, VCA masters, foldback buses. So what I'm going to show you now are audio buses. What are audio buses? Audio buses are kind of tracks that don't have any audio files. And you can send signal to them and out of them to somewhere else. Why? Uh, I will show you later on, but uh, if you think in a mixing board, so a aux send is basically a bus. Um, subgroups are also buses. So what I do before I start mixing, I usually create a stereo bus and I name it compressor bus. So I already did this and I decided to hide it before. So here it is. Compressor bus. If you want to change the position of the tracks to do so, select a track, click, uh, press on control, and ah, decide to stop working for me. Ah, here you go. And you press up or down, and you can change the position of the tracks. Or you can also use this window, that's why I think find it very helpful. And you can just uh, grab and uh, drag and drop. So the compressor bus, I want to have it after all my audio tracks that I inserted. The master, you can only move it this way. So control and press up or down on your keyboard. So the compressor bus, this compressor bus, I will place between my audio tracks and my master track. And I will send all my signals into the compressor bus and then to the master bus. Why? We will talk about at the end of the session. Hmm. So this is a good point to go to questions and answers. So if you guys have any questions about some things that I showed you right now, it was all very fast, or maybe about the multi-tracks project or other things. So is anybody from Bern Stefa, is anybody working with MacBook? Because I can't find the buttons that Rob is using in Windows. Uh, if you want, you can um, be a bit more specific which buttons exactly you were looking for. What's a compressor bus? <clears throat> so we are going to talk about the compressor bus a bit later on in um, on the session today. In this PDF down here, compression bus 
there's a cool website explaining what compressor buses are and why, when they started to use so a bit of a history where did mixing engineers start using compressor buses and what they are for. So nowadays people say we use it to glue tracks together and to trying to get all the dynamics from all the tracks a bit more in the same place before you even start compressing individual tracks. So Bernard Stefa, if you uh, can say which button exactly, I could maybe help you find it. Yeah, so I will copy the link to this PDF where you will find all of the web pages that I already talked about and going to talk about. Uh, give me a second. So here's the link to the PDF. Hmm. I was expecting that the Arduino program would be very similar on the Mac uh, or how it looks than on Windows. Um, maybe it looks very different. But I'm going to try to help you. So buttons like putting an audio into the program or the setting. So to add a track, if that's the question, in the mixing, so on the top right, you can change between editor view or mixing view. To add a track, press on this plus button here and this window will open. Or go up here to tracks, add track bus or VCA. And this, the same window will open. So this is how you can add a track to import a track, uh, an audio file. You can go up uh, on the top left, press on session and choose import. Then you select a audio track. So it has to be a audio track that also would work like a mp3 or a WAV file and click on import. Make sure that copy file to session is clicked on and Arduino will automatically create a track and import the audio track. Ah, I think I know what the question is. So when you open Arduino, a window will open up also to configure your interface for working together with Arduino. Arduino uses uh, a software called Jack. So it looks like this. This is the first thing that op uh, opens up. So it's a good idea to choose ASIO if you have an interface. If you do not have an interface, I don't know what's the name of it in uh, Mac, but uh, probably the, the first option that will show up. And you have to select the input and output from your device. Here you can choose the sample rate, so 48 kilohertz or 44.1. Buffer size, so for the buffer size, for mixing, it's a good idea to have the biggest number possible so that no clicks or pops happen when you insert plugins and use a bit more of the CPU power. Um, and for recording, it's better to have this number as low as possible. So next to it, you can see this number 32.7 milliseconds. This is how much latency happens when you are recording. 
when the sound get goes into Audu and comes back to your headphones. So 42.7 milliseconds is a lot for recording. Um, you should be around 10 milliseconds, preferably around 5 milliseconds. To do so, you have to change the sample rate to a lower number, but you have if you hear pops and uh, clicks in the sound that you are recording, then your um, CPU doesn't have enough power for so less sample rates, so you have to put the number as uh, higher to get rid of those clicks and pops that you will hear while it's recording. But if you have uh, too many milliseconds of latency, then it will be probably very um, difficult to record something. And then you press on start. And this will activate the connection between the interface and the software and start the session. <clears throat> to view this uh, window, you have to go to Window Audio MIDI Setup. And here you can set up the interface. So if I would now press on stop, you will stop hearing my voice because I'm using Audio to route the signal to the live stream. So I can not show you this. But I could do a video and post a video in the future where I show how to create a session from scratch and setting up all of this. <clears throat> so, let's now move on. Thank you for the questions. Signal routing. So, what is signal routing? Routing is when you tell the software which signal is going from where to where. On Audua, there's a very cool window. If you go on Window up here and go to Audio Connections or on Windows, press Alt P. And the patch bay will open up. So on the left side, you've got the sources. And on the bottom, you've got destinations. And you can choose what you want to see. So if you want to see your hardware inputs, if you want to have a look at the tracks that you have in your session, or the buses. On the destinations, you can see the buses, also the tracks, and the hardware output. So right now, all of the tracks that I imported are set to no output because I told Ardua I want to do it manually. I want to do it myself. So the only track I have set to an output is my compressor bus. It's set to master, so it goes to the output. Now I want to send a signal from my individual tracks into my compressor bus. So to do so, you need to open this window, the patch bay window. To do so, you go to Windows, Audio Connections, and this window will open up. Select Ardor Tracks on the sources. And down here, select Ardor Buses. So now you can say to Ardor, you want the kick in and out to go to the compressor bus input left and right. So if I press play, we will now hear that track coming out, coming through the speakers. Let's have a listen. So is the signal getting to your side? Can you hear the bass drum? Could you hear the bass drum coming through? All right, so it's working, very good. So now we said to Aldo that we wanted the track kick in to be routed to the compressor bus. If we would 
to turn that off, you would see no signal in the compressor bus. And you will also not be able to hear it. So this is the left side, this is the right side. So I'm going to do that to all the tracks. be a bit loud for you guys. I'm turning the tracks down. So now we've got all our four mono tracks routed through a stereo output going to a stereo input from the compressor bus which is also going stereo to the master and coming out through the speakers. So, back to the patch bay, the Ardor buses. So you see the compressor bus is routed to the master in. So if you have a stereo output, you shouldn't do this, because otherwise you're sending your left signal to uh, your left output to the left input and to the right input. And you don't want that. You want the left input to go to the left output. And you want the right output to go into the right input. So this is the correct way to route stereo tracks together. So if you go if you click on hardware in the destinations, you can see that my master out is going through my line 9 and line 10 for my interface. So this is how you can route your master to your outputs. Svenjamin, is my vocal also too loud? Or it was just the music? All right, just the music. So I'm going to show you now the faders. So here are the faders. With this, you can decide how loud your signal is. Right now my mono tracks have no panning because my mono tracks have only one output. So let's go back to the patch bay. If we go to sources, Ardor tracks, you can see that my kick in out, there's only one out. So if I want to have a stereo output, right click on it, add audio port. Now I've got two of them. So now I could route my stereo output into my stereo input accordingly. And now I've got a panning option to the right or to the left.
Now, a cool shortcut is also to press shift and click on the panning and it will go automatically to the center. Same thing with the fader. It will go automatically to zero. But right now I want to have my mono output for my mono track. Right now I don't need panning. So I'm going to delete what I just did and have a duplicate of that signal to the left and right. So <clears throat> let's talk a bit about metering. <clears throat> what is metering? So these green lights are your meters. There are different types of metering. If you right click on it, this will open. You can decide what you want to meter. If you click on input, we will see how much signal is coming in through the input that we, des we decided. But, uh, <laughs> okay. So if there's no input, nothing is happening, but we can still hear something because we are monitoring the inputs of the track and there's nothing happening there. You can also decide to choose what you want to see here. You can do pre-fader or post-fader. So pre-fader or post-fader, it's this fader what we are talking about. So. So if I turn the fader down and it's post fader, we don't see anything happening. If we go pre fader, we can see the level of the track. So what the level that the signal is going in, basically, the before the fader. But right now we need it post. There are also different type of meeting, uh, metering that are used for different uh, situations also arranged a very interesting link about this that you can find in the PDF. Let me turn the bass drum off. So down here, about meterings. So a link that goes directly to the uh, metering section from Ardua, talking about different types of meters and how to set them up in Ardua. Also looked up on Pro Tools because I used to use Pro Tools and I wanted to be sure that what I see is what I think I see. So, but I found this article also explaining a lot about the history of metering in the music industry. Also very, very interesting. So what we are using usually in a digital uh, uh, working station is sample peak. In the analog times, uh, people would use VU meters, but in a digital audio workstation, it makes more sense to have sample peaks. So to have a listen to this peak means sample peak. Uh, I forgot to open the last link. On Ardua, ah yeah, on the Ardua manual, there's also here a link to a very interesting article about metering in general and the history of metering. <clears throat> and also about mastering in the last 30 years what has been happening there, the difference between metering in the music industry and the film industry, because in the film industry, they managed to have like of a standard. So every movie has the same loudness level. In music, uh, there was this loudness war happening with uh, the mastering. 
where everyone was trying to get louder than the one before and there's no really big consensus on how loud music should be and there's also not much consensus on how to set your meters to do that and this article explains all of this very very well so it's a good read so in Ardua in my audio tracks I want to have sample peaks on my output I want to have K14 which is very good for mastering or K12 uh, excuse me K20 this is very good for uh, digital audio workstations for mixing so that you're sure that you're not peaking so you're not cutting the the, the heads of the, the the waves that you have but if you're used to um, the standard what comes with the most of the DAWs as a um, default is K14 and in your input peak so the difference between these two peaks is just if you go to the other one you don't see the plus 6 dBs on the top with this you can see until plus 16 but it's basically metered the same way so in the digital world, world, what is your level that you want to have when you are recording? Around minus 10. So you can see if I pull this up, the sounds. I probably have to turn my vocal a bit up so you can listen, hear my voice better. So if I go over minus 10, it starts going to orange, uh, yellow. It's okay, but yellow is kind of red, the red in analog world. So you shouldn't be too much in the yellow area when you're recording. So when I start to mix and import my tracks, the first thing I do is check that all my tracks, is to check that all my tracks are at minus 10. Ardu has a cool implemented trim in every track. In other softwares you have to place a plugin to trim them and Ardua has the trim implemented in the track. It's very very helpful. So let's have a listen to the individual uh, tracks and have a look if... Ah, we could also use the pre-fader view. So... We could also use that. So we can see the snare bottom track. So we've got the kick in, kick out, two microphones on, on the bass drum, then snare top and snare bottom. So the snare bottom is a bit low, so I can trim it a little bit up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And my snare is a bit too hot, maybe a dB or so. If you want to fine adjust, press Ctrl and Alt, and you will be in the keep hold them, and you can adjust them a bit more finely. So this is without me pressing Ctrl and Alt. This is with me pressing Ctrl and Alt. So it's very slow moves happening. It's very helpful sometimes. So. Let's have a listen to the kick in track. Kick out. So this is very typical. Kick in is a bit more pointy. Kick out is a bit more round. Let's have a listen to the snare top. Hey, this snare has a lot of ring. Could be good. Let's have a listen to snare bottom. Snare top. All right. Let's move on to the overheads. So we've got three overheads. We've got overhead center, 
left and right. So right now I want to move my overhead right close to the overhead left. So to do so, I select overhead right, click on control and press up and then I can move my track. <clears throat> so let's have a look at the meter from the overheads. I'm going to change the meter view from my post fader back to post. So my overheads could be a bit harder. So let's pull them up to minus 10. Okay, looking good. Let's have a listen to them. Let's start with overhead center. Overhead right. Overhead left. So I turned down the trim again because it did look a bit too hot in the harder parts from the song on the left and right, but I think center is now better. Maybe a bit down to 3.5 dBs. 3.7, yeah, looks good. Let's have a look at our room mics. Oh yeah, they're very hot. Go and select a loud part of the song. This looks pretty loud. So let's do a loop. To do a loop, you've got up here range marker, loop, uh, loop and punch range. Yeah, exactly. So click on with your right uh, button and then new loop range. And there you go. You can create now a loop. To play the loop, you need to activate the play loop range. And here we go. So what what does this does? When it gets at the end of the loop, it will jump back at the beginning of it. Like it just did. Okay, so Sven is saying that the, the audio is coming a bit double. It's because I'm not using my headphones. So I'll switch to my headphones so it will not go back in the microphone. Okay, this should be better now. Thank you, Sven. So let's trim a little bit the room mics. Let's turn them a bit down. Okay, this is looking good. Okay, let's have a listen to the to the real microphone. So this is room right. Let's have a listen to room left. So those were the room microphones. So let's have a look at the time. Okay, so we did one hour. So I want to talk a bit more about groups and subgroups and mix box compression. Uh, I will maybe do that again, but I will go now to question, questions and answers. So if you guys have questions, you can please uh, write them in the chat and hopefully I can help you out. Oh, Matthias Amador. So it's getting a bit too specific. 
All right, looking forward to sessions for beginners. That would be great. Okay, so if uh, you can specify at what point um, it started to get a bit more specific, let me know. Okay, Julie, so yeah, in the analog world, uh, it's different than in the digital. So analog, when it starts getting red, it's where it's getting too hot and you pull it back down. In the digital, it's a bit different because of what the meters are showing us. So in an analog, there's dif different type of metering shown. And it's very important to stay at minus 10 dB so you've got enough headroom. So it means you've got all, uh, enough space to get things louder in the mixing process and the mastering process. If you do that right away, you will have less headroom and you will cut a lot of uh, peaks happening and lose a lot of dynamic. Glad I could help out with that. Okay, the rooting part. Let's go back to the rooting. So, let's go to the editor window. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, let me grab something. So in recording, there are usually two types of recordings. One is mono and one is uh, stereo. So mono means it's only one signal path. So if you use a microphone, it's one source, one output, it's one track. If uh, you're using a guitar or a bass, it's also just one signal. Um, stereo usually are like keyboards or stereo, so you've got two signals coming out that are different. One is penned on the left and one is penned on the right. It sounds a bit wider. Um, and in your digital audio workstation, you've got also stereo or digital or uh, uh, mono or stereo tracks. So since we recorded drums and we used microphones, we've got analog tracks. Some of them are called overhead left and overhead right, for example. Later on, I will route them into a stereo bus so that I've got a stereo track. So it's a sum from two mono doing one stereo. And it's the same thing with the room. So you've got room left and right. So you've got actually a stereo signal, but recorded in two monos. So let's create a bus and let's redo the routing. So I'm going to do a bus for the rooms. Audio bus. And I'm going to say to Audio, I want a stereo bus. But keep it flexible. So it's going to create two inputs and two outputs probably. Let's have a look. So I'm going to place now Bus one that I just created after room left and right. I'm going to change the name of it. To do so, go over here, right click, rename, room stereo bus. All right. So let's have a look at the patch bay once again. So, source. I want to have a look at my bus that I created, room stereo bus, so it has two outputs. That's what I wanted. 
let's go back to the tracks and let's have a look at the destination from the buses so where is it room stereo bus in so it also has two so it's I create a stereo bus I've got two inputs and two outputs so now I'm going to route the room left to the room stereo bus left and route the room right to this room stereo bus right channel. So now I've got the room left going to the left speaker, room right going to the right speaker. What you can also do is say to Adwo that the room left doesn't have only one output, it has two outputs. And the room right also has two outputs. So you say to Adwo you want the left output from the room to go to the left input and the right one to the right, and so on, like I showed before. Stereo to stereo looks like this. So this way my mono track now has a panning section. So now I can tell the room left goes to the left right and room right goes to the right side. But I could also switch them if I want to switch the perspective. went wrong with my routing. Let me have a look. Oh yeah. So I also have to say where I want my bus to go to. And I want my bus to go to my compressor bus. So the room stereo bus is going now into the compressor bus and the compressor bus will go to the mastering to the master output So basically what this does, when I duplicate on a mono track the output, I'm just sending actually the same signal to two outputs. I'm not making a mono signal suddenly stereo, it's still a mono signal, it's just going the same, the same thing to two tracks, basically. So that I can decide how much or how loud a signal is on the left or the right side. So, I'm going to redo the process for my overheads. So, audio bus, stereo, and I'm going to call it that way right away. So, overhead, stereo. Bus, create it, place it after my overhead tracks, <clears throat> go to my patch bay. So to not do the same mistake I made before, I'm going now to say that I want the output of my overhead stereo bus to the input of my compressor bus. Before I forgot that. So, and now I'm going to say that the overhead left has another output, overhead right also, and the center also, so that they have a panning option. Otherwise, they would not have a panning option. And now I'm going to route my overhead stereo outputs into my overhead stereo bus inputs.
and now my mono tracks have panning. So I'm going to pan my overhead left to the left, my overhead right to the right, and keep my overheads center to in the center. Okay, something else wrong. Hmm. Okay. Where life's going to the stereo buses? Ah. Okay, so when I created at the beginning, I routed all of my signals to the master. So I had a duplicate. So when I reroute my mono tracks when I do subgroups I have to think about turning off the connection I made with the master output all right okay now we've got stereo room stereo overheads. So I'm going to turn it back to mono. Everything in the center. And now stereo. Again in the room. So it's very helpful to have these subgroups because this way I have one fader for the whole room and one fader for the overheads. And I can also place plugins on them and not have to have individual plugins on all the overhead tracks and all the room tracks so I only need one IQ for example on my overhead stereo bus and do my IQ for my overheads over there and only use one plugin instead of using three in this case where we have three overheads <clears throat> so I also usually do a subgroup for the toms because I also place the toms in a stereo manner So, learning from my mistakes, turn off the floor tom and the rack tom output that I created before. Tell them they need an extra output, route them to my stereo tom uh, bus, tom stereo bus, now let's have a look at the toms. So when we recorded the drums right after, we decided to clean up the tom tracks right away, instead of leaving it for the mixing engineer later on. Sometimes you do that by mixing a knot and in the talk we had with the with the producer that mixed it, he wanted to have that beforehand, so we did it right away. <clears throat> Let's place our loop range over there. In this tom fill. Where is it there? Mm 
Now we have a loop. Let's go back to the mixing view and let's trim the toms because we didn't do that before. So let's have a look what their levels are. Okay, we can turn them down. So pressing Control Alt, go to the trim to find adjust it. So I'm, let's do minus one dB. Ah, it's gonna need more than that. I think something like five. Okay. Yeah, looking good. Let's have a listen to the toms. Oh yeah. <laughs> so another place you can also route your inputs and outputs. So the outputs is down here. I'm going to do that in my Tom Serio bus. I'm just going to tell it, okay, you go to the compressor bus. There you go. The reason why I use this is to make sure that I've got the occurring amount of outputs in my mono tracks, if I've got two or if I've got one. Now they are stereo. Okay. So <clears throat> now comes the part where this is important to know how many outputs you've got. So I'm going to create two buses, this time mono for the snare and for the kick. And I'm going to place the first one after the snare and the second one after the kick tracks. I'm going to rename them accordingly. Kick bus. Let's call it mono so we know that. Let's go here and call it snare mono bus. Okay. So let's say that the bus has to go now to my compressor bus and it doesn't show up. I have to go to the patch bay and it doesn't show up because if you go to the order buses in the sources and you have a look at how many outputs the kick mono has is one. So I need one more. So now I'm going to route it to my compressor bus. So I'm going to do this way for the for the kick bus and this way for the snare. Call compressor bus in. So going back to here. Ardor tracks. So kick in and out are going to the compressor bus. We don't want that. I want them to go to my mono inputs from the bus over here. So if we have a look here, if the bus would have two inputs, it would not show in this list. That's why it's important to be sure how many inputs and outputs your tracks and buses have. So. I'm going to send my kick in to my kick mono bus in. Kick mono bus in. And the same for the snare. So over here we don't have the inputs that we would see here in the stereo one. Here we would see the stereo buses. Master in, compressor bus, overhead stereo, room stereo, and so on. On the mono tracks outputs we only have the mono inputs. So 
So snare mono bus. Okay. Now we got it rooted accordingly. Okay. So now we've got our routing done. We've got our kick mono bus with our two kick tracks going mono in and stereo out. The same with the snare going stereo out, going to the, the, the mono out, going to the mono in from the bus and the stereo bus out going to the stereo bus in from the compressor bus. I know. <clears throat> so, our floor toms are stereo, so we can pen them where we want them. Going to the tom bus, the overheads too, and the room compressor also. So before I start mixing, I will now add or before I do my balance, I'm going to add a compressor on my compressor bus. You can go down a big list. So to go over here, <coughs> sorry, just jumped that, that part. So to insert a plugin, click on the right button of your mouse. And this will show up where you can add plugins or do aux sends. You can either go by creator, so by who made the, the plugin and go through a list, or you can use the plugin manager, which has a search func function. So I'm going to pick the compressor bus I want to use. Put my compressor bus setting in. Yeah. And here you can move the position of your plugins. So when it's red, it's before the fader, but Ardua also allows you to place a plugin after the fader, which I don't have any use right now in my head, but who knows? Maybe I get at one point creative and know what to do with that. <laughs> So here I've got my plugin. So it means the signal is going inside the compressor bus, going into the compressor that I applied over here, and then going through the fader. So ignore the stream, because this is the sound going for you guys. So this would usually not be there. So going through the fader, going then from the output of the bus into the input of my master, and going then from those outputs into my speakers. So the compressor bus. I'm going to talk a bit more about the compressor bus function uh, in another episode, but in the PDF that I share with you, there's an article about it, also explaining how to set it up. And we will talk about later on about the reason why I place it before I start doing my balance. So it would be too much for this session. So let's do a quick balance.
Okay, so I just did a quick balance and now I would check the phase of the, the drums, but I think we should finish the live stream for today. Thank you for watching. Uh, in case you guys uh, have uh, some last questions, you can place them now about the Multitracks project or about the things I was doing today. And if you guys have um, subjects you would like me to talk about and show, you guys can write it down in the, in the chat so I can gather them and think about what we can do next in the, in the live stream. Yeah, no problems. We can do uh, different things. If I know what uh, f we can do uh, different um, levels, uh, advanced or more beginners. If I know what subjects are interesting for you uh, or would help you out. Um, I can plan some live streams that are more for beginners and some that are more for advanced and um, place that in the title of the, the episode so you guys know what to expect. Uh, by curiosity, uh, Yuli, was this uh, too much of uh, for beginners for you, or was it kind of uh, okay, or would you rather to have it way more advanced? Beginner session mix for guitar, vocals, and percussion. All right. Cool, Yuli. Hi, Hannes. <laughs> nice to, to see you here. Um, so cool that this is perfect for you. Uh, Ni Han Jan. I hope I'm spelling, uh, reading your name right. Ni Han Jan. So beginners session mix for guitar, vocals and percussion. So I guess you mean acoustic guitar. So in this song we actually did uh, record acoustic guitars and vocals, obviously, and percussion in this song, not really. Um, the drums are like a lot of percussive instruments altogether. <clears throat> so in the next episode I think I will go a bit more deep into mixing uh, the drums and we will start also up to listen to the bass and guitars so they will come up uh, mixing acoustic guitars also and vocals in the next episodes and yeah so I will also be uh, posting in the multicore channel YouTube channel and in the shared platform group on Facebook uh, the episodes that I did uh, back in March and April which are uh, complete mixes, so six hours uh, videos, where I mix a song from beginning to uh, from start to end. So maybe you can already see some things for guitar and vocals and percussion in there. All right, so thank you a lot. Um, glad you guys were there and hope there was some helpful information and hope you have fun with Ado in case you do not have a DAW or if you're looking for a new DAW, I hope this helps. Then I wish you a good evening and hope to see you soon in the next episode. I think I will be doing this like every three weeks, something like that. 
But uh, let's see how it goes. So, bye!